How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the Headwater Science Center live stream. I'm Carl. We have James behind the camera. So feel free to stop by the Science Center any day of the week, Monday through Saturday. We are open 930 to 5. And on Sunday, we are open 1 to 5. So today, we're going to talk about another animal from the earlier Cenozoic, and that is Paraceratherium. We're going to fix that glare there. So Paraceratherium is probably one of the most spectacular mammals to ever live and for a really distinct reason and behind me i drew something so i typically draw for scale a person but today i wanted to draw for scale another animal that we tend to have a bit more familiarity with so right here is an african elephant we have a human behind the, the paraceratherium paraceratherium is one of two mammals that is debated which one is the largest land mammal ever to live. Uh, just taking a second to look at that size difference. The African elephant is currently the largest living land animal, period. If you're on Earth today, that is the biggest animal currently. Not the case in the past. So, Paraceratherium lived roughly 34 to 23 million years ago. And they're mammals. They're in the fam they're in the order Persidactyla, so the odd toed ungulates. They are so actually that's uh kind of closely related to some of the other animals we've covered, like the woolly rhino, which we'll get to that a bit more. They're in the family Paracer Paraceratheridae and in the genus Paraceratherium. And there are four species. Now, another added little thing is they are in the, let's see where I wrote this down. I have it written somewhere. So they're in the super family Rhinoceratidae. They are actually really closely related to modern day rhinos to the point where a lot of people simply refer to these things as a kind of rhino. So these animals were found pretty much exclusively in Eurasia during the Oligocene. Which I'm going to scroll down to geologic time, which the Oligocene was about about 40 million years ago to about 23 million years ago. Uh, these animals, again, they're modern day relatives. Uh, we can broaden that out to not just rhinos, but also horses and tapirs. And oftentimes these animals will be depicted with a slight little trunk like a tapir has. So they were massive browsing animals. These things were herbivores. I, I don't think I could ever picture a carnivore getting that big, really. And they ranged in habitat from scrubland to fragmented forests. And again, I want to stress the massive body size of this animal. 15.7 feet at the shoulder is pretty normal for the skeletons we've got. 24.3 feet in length. A neck. Just a neck that is 4.3 feet long, not to mention the head on top of that, and weighing potentially anywhere from 33,000 pounds to 44,000 pounds. Multi-ton animals. And at that size, even at the time, they probably would have had, as an adult, no natural predators at that point. And if I may ask a quick yeah. question. Is that the primary reason for them being so large, is just protecting against predation, do you think? It probably is a part of it, but not the only reason. We'll get into size like we have talked about with other animals in the past. So the other thing is they also, from what we can tell from the skeletons, had long lifespans. 80 to 90 was probably within these animals' well, ability to live. When you're that big, it takes a while to grow to that size. And also they are actually pretty likely as as big or close to as big as a mammal on land can get and now is when we're going to get into some of the things about that size some of the challenges that can come with it uh, we were talking a little bit before the live stream about this one thing is blood flow when you are that big you have to be able to pump blood with oxygen in it from your heart all the way up at, into your brain, all the way down into your toes. That takes a massive heart. There's a lot of force generated to push the blood around. 
another difficulty for an animal of this size is regulating their body temperature. Um, other things, reproducing becomes a bit of an issue. Not only the act of reproducing, but also gestating and birthing the young. Uh, I'm sure everyone is roughly familiar with elephants having a long pregnancy. The actual length is pretty close to two years. These animals very likely exceeded that. Meaning they were pregnant potentially for two and a half, three years. It takes a while to build the baby at that point. And then also at that size, you have to be able to feed that body. I mean, you have to find enough food to fuel this every day. It, this animal likely spent the bulk of its life eating and probably focused on not a lot else. So another thing with mammals that limits our size, though, is actually our skeletons. So we talked about this with um, titanosaurs. Oh, man, that's months ago at this point. But... Mammal skeletons tend to be a lot more solid and having less hollow spaces, meaning the bones are heavier. And part of that is going to add weight that the foot and the leg have to support, which is already going to limit size a little bit. Another thing about that is, like we talked about, maintaining your body temperature becomes very difficult, especially for an animal that can live in quite hot environments. Uh, like scrubland and desert, you could overheat very easily, and that is very dangerous. Uh, elephants today, you look at our, our African elephant, their elephants in Africa have those massive ears to fan themselves, to cool themselves off at the heat of the day, and they tend to avoid being active. In fact, elephants and many large animals tend to be quite active at night. Um... So, we've talked about these disadvantages being big. What are some of the advantages? So, first thing, as we talked about, not having to worry about predators is a great thing. Not having to worry about something trying to eat you really takes a load off of your back. Another thing is also regulating temperature. Larger animals tend to have more stable body temperatures given ideal conditions. You're putting a little bit less energy in the long term into regulating this. Um, another one is you can eat a lot of food. While you need a lot of food, you can also eat a lot. You can store a lot of food. You can gorge yourself. Meaning you can go a little bit longer potentially without food. You might have to travel very far, but you can make those journeys to get to other food sources. And then lastly, it adds a bit of efficiency for movement. Two steps for an elephant is a lot more efficient than a thousand steps for a mouse. Uh, covering a simple distance is easier for a larger animal because of a longer stride. So there are some distinct advantages to being this big. And weren't you mentioning the other day also um, reach? They can stay in a single space and have access to a lot more food. Yeah, your, food. your feeding envelope is what this is called, is what James is referring to, is the, the area accessible to you without t moving from that spot becomes bigger the bigger you are. This is why a lot of dinosaurs, like sauropods, had those long necks, because then they could reach these massive areas without taking a step. Um, and elephants have the trunk for the exact same reason. Being able to reach really far with that trunk and just pull food to them is a great one. Also being this large and tall gives Paraceratherium the great advantage of access to very high food sources. So a thing we need to talk about at the time is the habitat this animal lived in. It's a very different planet. Uh, around you know 34 to 23 million years ago there were a lot of you know, scrubland, fragmented forests. And a habitat we tend to take for granted in the modern day is a grassland. Those really weren't prevalent anywhere yet. Grass evolved around 50 million years ago, but grasslands didn't become widespread and prominent until about 5 million years ago, meaning there weren't a lot of grazing opportunities for animals. So when you're browsing, this animal was able to compete really well with other browsers by being able to access food sources most other animals just couldn't reach. 
And we also do not find other very large herbivores from that time in the fossil record. Likely because Paraceratherium was very efficient, very good at what it did. And that principle is called the principle of competitive exclus exclusion. Competitive exclusion means two animals cannot occupy the exact same niche in a given ecosystem or habitat. Animals can get very close to similar niches with each other, but they very infrequently overlap for very long. Typically, one animal is going to wind up being or becoming more efficient over time. So these animals likely also outcompeted a lot of other animals for that high browsing large herbivore. And they very likely were quite good at outcompeting animals at water sources, being able to push other animals out of those precious water sources to drink and get their fill of water to keep themselves hydrated. And overall, a really spectacularly unique animal. They, again, as I said, they're a relative of the, the rhino today and a quite close relative. And they look very distinct. Again, they almost look like a giraffe in a lot of ways, have a, having a somewhat long neck. And in fact, this is also probably the tallest mammal to ever live. Um, and they're very just unique among animals. We don't have... We don't have these anywhere, although we do have elephants. And elephants do a lot of the same thing. But generally, these animals were quite successful until some habitat shift happened, and we're still actually a little bit unclear, given that these animals could handle a broad range of habitat, what exactly was an effect of that shift that caused them to go extinct. So as we talked about on Saturday, we talked about entelodons. Entelodons actually cohabitated areas with these animals. This shared a habitat with one of, those, one of the nastiest, meanest animals ever to live, showing you how tough and how kind of untouchable Paraceratherium really was ecologically. They were likely just too big for anything to mess yeah. with, even an animal like the size of a bison. So oftentimes they're also depicted um, without hair. It's kind of, I wasn't able to depict it quite well, but this animal is supposed to be hairless. And oftentimes with large mammals, they do tend to lose hair. You'll notice that rhinos, hippos, and elephants today do not have a lot of body hair. And that's because in warm climates, you really don't want to insulate. You want to have the opposite. You want, you want poor insulation. You want to be able to get rid of heat. That's one of the reasons elephants have those big ears and those massive body surfaces, because those radiate heat well. The ears can not only fan them, but also just radiate heat out. There's a lot of blood vessels in there. Paraceratherium has often been depicted with slightly larger ears than you would picture on an animal that size, proportionately. Uh, I didn't have the real inclination to draw it that way. Um, another thing about them is, so actually talking about size, I forgot to mention, it does sort of limit your anatomy to a degree. You'll notice that the bigger animals get, the thicker their limbs get, especially for mammals. Well, you have to support that weight. So you'll notice a lot of times elephants, they tend to try to keep their legs underneath them at all times. You don't want to be too unstable and you don't want to have all your weight resting on one foot. So another thing about these animals, they likely were not very fast. Uh, Paraceratherium probably was a pretty slow moving cuckoo. James, do you have any questions or anything you want to add about these guys? Yeah. Um, I guess mostly what I'm wondering is just, yeah, so like going back to the advantages of being just big. Hyper, yeah, size like that. It seems to me, um, given especially the time period that they're in, like how hardcore some of the, the predator competition was. Definitely safety from predators. These animals were going to also cover, right now, we're going to cover a lot more of the animals that lived in the Oligocene and Miocene. And next week and the week after, we're going to cover um another animal at some point that lived around these and it'll probably also make a lot more sense why you'll notice a lot of the herbivores we'll cover from that era are going to be pretty big yeah and is that it so is it it seems like there must have been some sort of kind of like arms race between predators and prey for a, yeah. a while in that time period yeah oftentimes animals um it's much like antelope and cheetahs today Antelope are very fast, very nimble, and cheetahs are very fast and nimble. Pretty much in direct response to each other. It's the constant need to be able to catch your food or not be someone else's food. Often drives a lot of evolutionary pro like 
pressure is. And it's, sort of it's a specific like, pressure on it. Yeah. Yeah. It relates to like the Red Queen hypothesis a little bit. Although that's a little bit more involved with like like pathogenic parasites. But I think that predation as a type of parasitism... I think fits that model pretty well. Again, counts, yeah. when you have a certain predation model, when you live in an environment with large carnivores going after you, be bigger than them. Mm -hmm. Be so big they don't want to mess with you. It's a really good strategy. And then it's like, why do those predators get so dang mean? And then it's because, well, the prey is getting Kept big. bigger. It's, then... yeah, it's a feedback loop. It, yep. And what we probably will cover feedback loops a little bit more. We're probably going to cover, actually a lot of animals in this general time period will be really great for that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they lived alongside a lot of very odd animals like entelodons. And it was a really interesting time on Earth. Um, just again, the world had bounced back from the extinction of the dinosaurs. Mammals had diversified incredibly. Filled all, basically all of those empty niches. And the new ones that had come up. And it really led to some of the most re remarkable animals to ever walk the earth. Yeah, and, so if grassland wasn't a thing by the start of this period, and really wasn't a thing until very, a lot very later. Late, um, what were some of the new niches that were made for the mammals? For mammals, a lot of it was the, for the herbivores to be browsing at different heights. Like, these guys are great at high so like browsing kind of for sure. So, like, specializing the... A lot like what you see today, yeah. Where herbivores, we tend to simplify it to be grazing, browsing, but then you look at those two things. If you look at browsing, Africa's a great example. Um, rhinos, elephants, giraffes, and antelope, or some antelope, don't browse at the same heights. They, they don't eat the same. Different resource niches. They don't eat the same height of the plants. Uh, it'd be somewhat impractical for a giraffe to reach down to the height that a rhino is eating at. Right. And it would be impossible for the rhino to eat up to where the giraffe is. Area. And the elephant's able to handle that more middle and more flexible area when they browse. Yeah. Um. So otherwise, there was also a lot of the carnivorous niches, and um, the dinosaurs weren't the only animals that left niches behind. We'll cover a few more of these mammals that broadened into other areas, yeah. which that's mammals did some weird things. The thing that's interesting to me about um, maturing ecosystems is that the longer they go on, it seems like they start to create their own little sub-niches within niches that sort of cause more and more differentiation. Yeah. Like it's like a level of like, no for two example, like a coral reef where there's just so, many so much different variety. No two ecosystems really ever are the same. There's um, just too many variables. There's too many variables, too many things happen. And again, since evolution is a, rel is a random process, you never know what mutations are going to happen. You never know what new animals and plants are going to, and pathogens are going to occur that are going to affect the whole thing. Again, um, grass. Just grass evolving radically changed our planet. Today, grass is pretty much the dominant form of plant life. Um, we tend to think of it as the large open prairies, but you'll find types of grasses that can even grow in forests and such. What is it that makes grass special? Grass has an incredible durability as an organism and as a root system. Mm -hmm. A wildfire can come through and burn the top of a grassland, burn down almost to the ground. The very first the back. It's the first plant to come back because mm -hmm. that root system is relatively safe from the fire. Mm. They're able to regenerate from that and store a lot of nutrients and other resources in their roots. So, is there uh, some grass sort of and special trees... symbiosis that they have with, um, with like fungus or like all plants? Bacteria? Yeah, like all plants have uh, that symbiotic relationship. Often has a very specific fungus. Yeah. And I guess um, wonder if grasses is special compared to others. Not particularly. The big thing with grass is the fact that so trees, most of the plant is above the surface. Right. With grass, most of the plant is below the surface. And having most of that plant safe, also from herbivores, because again, most herbivores that graze aren't really pulling up at the roots always. They're, they're taking the grass. So grass is also relatively safe from herbivores. It's good at weathering being eaten. So grass is a tough plant just from a biological standpoint. In a way, I wonder if, if part of the... This is just complete speculation. Yeah. If the... Um, the flowering part of a, or not flowering, but just the stem part of grass being the stuff that just barely extends on the surface, but in terms of biomass, 
is way uh, smaller than the root system underneath. I wonder if that could almost be like beyond just needing something to grab sunlight. If it could also be sort of a defense mechanism, like here, herbivores eat this. You like know, mostly bit of not. Grass. And also, yeah. um, the big thing with grass is it's mostly not super nutritious. Yeah. So grazing animals have to eat a lot of it. Elephants are a good example of a, both a browsing and a grazing animal. They tend to lean a lot on grazing, especially compared to their relatives, as we talked about with like mastodons. Just because there's so much grass around. When you have a resource that's so plentiful, even if it's kind of terrible for yeah. eating as far as nutrition goes, if you can pack a lot of it, and that's actually part of why elephants are so big, they can pack grass in. Are elephants ruminants? Um, I believe they are so with elephants they're not super closely related to other herbivorous animals like perissa and artiodactyls and we were going to go over more about elephants but they are they tend to just have a long intestine they are not they're regurgitating just, just, and chewing it they yeah. are hind gut fermentation so they just basically rely on a super long intestine to, yes to just similar get every little bit out. similar strategy to like yeah. rhinos and yeah and paraceratherium where it's just put a bunch of stuff in i didn't really think about that but if you give yourself so much more volume on the inside it means that you can pack in way more length of mm -hmm. intestine and be way more efficient at, at absorbing your nutrients exactly that's one of, we were talking about that earlier is one of the big advantages to getting big is while you do need a lot more food you can also pack a lot more food in there. You can just eat and eat and eat. And again, like we talked about, this animal probably spent most of its life eating. Mm -hmm. If you ever look at elephants, they spend a lot of their day eating too. Mm -hmm. And they actually spend a lot of their night eating. Elephants are actually semi-nocturnal. And these animals likely did too, that nocturnal activity, because one, it's cooler at night. If you're a big animal, it's better to be moving around when it's nice and cool out. You can be a bit more active. Um, and also you're a bit safer. Um, these animals did also tend to, much like elephants do today, they'll prefer large open areas. Uh, hill, steep inclines and stuff are actually relatively dangerous for large animals. If Is you it fall just over, they lose balance? it's mostly not about losing balance. It's if you fall over, uh, as many people's grandparents probably said, if I go down there, I'm not coming back up. Yeah. If you fall down as an elephant or a paraceratherium, that can mean game over. Yeah, you very likely have a severe injury from that fall. Mm -hmm. Elephants that trip and fall over often break bones in their legs, and as a wild elephant, you don't really have time to heal or even get up. Yeah. That is the most vulnerable time of your life, is if you lay down. These animals tend to sleep standing up. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get this big, you don't want to lay down. Yeah. You don't want to give predators that opportunity to get at you. Because when you think of a lot of the predators, there's a person, you, we could reach up and slap the belly, but if you're like a hyena size, you can't reach you can't even get up the vulnerable that. size. You can't reach that area that's vulnerable. Um, For that reason, humans probably seem pretty threatening to like elephant. an elephant. Um, we kind of are. Yeah, because we are so tall, they probably recognize that we can get at areas that other like predators can't. Possibly. I mean, the other thing is being so big. If you really look at it, without modern technology, we can't do a lot to elephants. But I feel like if you had, and this is, I don't actually know, but you, like, maybe, like a spear, I feel like, could do a lot of damage. A spear is, is one of the main things you can do, and also you will notice, though, even in areas of the world where you can't, where they did hunt elephants and they still sometimes poach today, in modern day, they use modern weapons for a reason. And even back in the Neolithic, when you're hunting animals like mammoths and stuff, you didn't do it often. You did it, like, not even every year, because that's a very dangerous thing, even if you have everything going for you. Yeah. They're the a big, is, is smart, reward, dangerous animal. The reward is... Well, that's the thing, is they're very smart. Too. The reward is massive, reward like you're about to say. Massive, yeah. It's massive, but also the potential failure is if catastrophic. Could, yeah, if you could support yourself off of hunting smaller prey, don't, do it. Isn't as damaging. If, you if, just, that's what you would do. If you can, yeah. If you don't need to, don't hunt a big animal. Yeah. Uh, general wisdom as a predator. Yeah. If, like for like, if you're like a modern human hunting, if you are a wolf, if you're a bear, if you're a hyena, a cat, if you can hunt a smaller animal, do it. Mm -hmm. Don't go for the big animal. <laughs> thinking about the sort of risk-reward uh, nature yeah. that, that sort of defines all Predators. Well, also, 
especially predators. Predators, it's high risk reward. Uh, you risk dying every time you hunt. Uh, modern lions, a predator we tend to think of as pretty tough and indestructible, are always at risk of not just failing hunts, but getting lethally injured or just crippled. From the injured. Of these from prey, animals. prey animals, everything from an elephant down to a rabbit, make it as difficult as possible to be eaten. Mm -hmm. And as we see with these animals, one of the ways to be really difficult is just to be so big, there's got to be something easier around. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, other than that, then I'm going to say we're going we're gonna to let you all go. Thank you for tuning in.